Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I'm your host, Carla Duke, and today I'm joined by Om Tandon. Om is the director of UX at Wildlife, one of the leading mobile game development studios and publishers in the world, with their games being downloaded over 2 billion times. Om is also the creator of UX Reviewer, where he publishes regular blogs on UX, and a guest writer at Deconstructor of Fun. Today, we're going to talk about free-to-play and mobile gaming trends sweeping the industry right now, best practices and advice for those interested in developing a better user experience in their games, and some of the takeaways from Om's decade-long experience thinking, analyzing, and interpreting player behavior. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 12 of season two of the Zero to Play podcast. Welcome on to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Om and I go way back. We worked at Gameloft together and we've kept in touch. He's now in Dublin, uh, in Ireland, uh, working at Wildlife uh, remotely. Is that right? Yeah, we, we have a, they have an office here, but of course, like most companies, we are working remotely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So that's that's definitely the trend that we're seeing seeing at the moment and i think gaming uh games in general do a good job of working remotely um we we were remote for a period of time here at rocketworks although i do find especially when when you're kind of in a a startup environment or when you're when you're kind of building the team you haven't got clear processes you're kind of figuring out new processes it's it's good to be in person to to figure that out um but uh i'm not sure is wildlife quite a structured um company do you find working remotely easy yeah that, that's a very interesting question uh carl because i think uh, before the pandemic most companies were slightly more you know guarded not just wildlife but i think in general uh, because i've been talking to other companies as well um for a time when i was consulting before that and while they said okay there are functions which can work remotely you know like marketing play support the core team they wanted together exactly for the reason you mentioned you know mm. nothing beats face time nothing beats people in the same room mm. but i think uh with pandemic everybody's hand was forced and like you said correctly you know gaming boomed and a lot of it firms boomed mm. i mean People were already doing work from home twice or thrice a week, at least twice a week, you know, in IT and software. And I think it just naturally got extended. So yeah, uh, wildlife is really good. Their onboarding process are really good from what I've found so far. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's fun. It, it's, it could be a challenge sometimes to align, you know, people in different parts of the world. But I think uh, it also gives you the opportunity to hire talent, which mm-hmm. many companies or studios would normally not be able to, you know, Mm. uh get people to relocate to so i think yeah it's what you make of it you know uh, yeah yeah pros and cons it's a different different environment for sure um so i want to go back to your past so i saw um on your linkedin that you went to uh university for bef- behavioral economics um and i find that being a, a fascinating um kind of major and it also, it looked like that that was around the same time that free-to-play was kind of emerging in the mobile games market. And I just want to um, ask what it was like studying behavioral e- economics at this moment when mobile gaming was kind of emerging and booming as a, as a market within gaming. So, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And... To 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 be honest with you, like uh, when I took up economics, so I did economics honors, and it had different parts, you know, macroeconomics, micro behavioral economics, uh, statistics, mathematics. So uh, it was kind of both theory as well as a lot of you know maths and stats, which I was okay with, <laughs> but not great at it. But I was more fascinated by you know, as you said correctly, the behavioral economics part was small, like one semester or so. But it fascinated me because it was all about psychology, and I loved all about you know Adam Smith's uh, concepts and classical dichotomy, new theories, you know Karl Marx's socialist theories, and then capitalist theories. It was good to read all that. Mm-hmm. At that point of time, I had no clue that I'll become a UX person down the line because, as you know, UX was not a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
but uh, my actually plan n- next natural plan for me was to get into you know uh, doing mba and all actually i sat for an mba exam in my country mm-hmm. and the interesting mm-hmm. thing is when the day i had uh, entrance for 12 a to b level colleges you know i did pretty well i got around 80 percentile in a entrance test uh, i i was like very hesitant here were these 12 entrances you know that i could choose some of the best schools in the country and i said no i don't want to do mba Mm-hmm. Uh, enough economics i want to do something creative i had a creative flair i just didn't know where to channelize it so mm-hmm. that's when i took the decision of going into gaming but that too in the art side not on not as you know as a psychologist or as a ux researcher right okay so you started off as an as an artist in in games yeah um and that actually kind of leads to a question that i i wanted to ask you in this chat was one thing that i i I don't like seeing, but I'd love to know from your perspective is when you see job positions that advertise for a UI slash UX designer and how that that is in a way lumping two different career paths, one artistic side and one data driven side. And uh, what is your perspective being a UX director when you see roles that advertise for a UI slash UX role? That, that's a very interesting question. Again, Carl, and there are multiple perspectives. So uh thankfully before wildlife and uh, when i took a break from gaming after 14 years two years i was working at this company called eaton you know which is like general electric and my wife is also a ux designer but always in the enterprise industry you know she's worked in banking aerospace so we always know what what's happening ux in games and ux outside games differ you know in my mind it does and they do have these roles called product designers so product designers and i had a team of product designer in my previous company they do both ux and ui mm-hmm. so i think it's not per se bad to have ux ui roles but in gaming industry because there's a lot of emphasis on the art side of things so we call them ui artists because you know they can spend a lot of time polishing icons and illustrations mm-hmm. that's where it gets complicated i think for me i've always built in believing specialized teams so when i mean specialized a hey, have dedicated ui people have dedicated ux people even have dedicated ui technical art you know uh, that's what i had at way back at digit we had these three separate functions the reason being if you want to do the best possible work that you want to within each discipline you need to free up that person's time you know uh, like i got into ux almost 8 years back before that i was a creative director and i did ui design for so i started from concept artist concept art 3d art and then ui and there was a fork in the road there was a time when i had to choose do i want to be a ux ui designer or should i just do ui or ux and i realized there's a different mindset like you said you know ux person is about being objective you are measuring everything you know you have more scientific approach to things mm-hmm. you should be able to you know step back and critique almost like a scientist validate stuff mm-hmm. but on the ui side you are very subjective you you are expressing all the feelings mm-hmm. the emotions you know it's very easy to fall in love with what you have created especially out of multiple iterations so i don't think especially in games given the amount of you know uh, artistic uh, approach and freedom that you need for ui a person can balance it i'm not saying people can't balance it they can there are rock stars you know unicorns but long term i do believe by building these specialized you know functions we allow the ux person to just do full justice to their job ui person to just do full justice to their job mm-hmm. they are not bothered by you know this other time constraint time constraint is a big thing in gaming everybody knows mm-hmm. it so here is an example if you get 3 days to you know de- deliver a feature six screens mm-hmm. if you have to do both ux and ui and also user research tell me how much time would you want to spend on user research ux design validating with users compared to when you have to work on the art side of things too mm. just not possible so i think for the best quality my belief is we should uh, specialize build specialized functions as much as possible mm-hmm. yeah that's cool no you, you did a good job there of um yeah explaining the difference uh, because i think even even me someone who's had uh, several years in the gaming industry now hearing the, like you kind of need to be reminded um about about how those roles differ um i think though for mobile gaming especially the role of a a ux designer is so important just because of the retention the the free to play model uh, and i think that, that that makes ux designers very valued at mobile gaming companies especially compared to uh pc and console and you know d- those different kinds of experiences and and that's what i really want to want to get deep into is 
uh, what what your kind of experience has led you to learn from a, a mobile gaming perspective. So could you could you tell me like a, a good piece of, of UX and a bad piece of UX when it comes to a mobile game, like a generic mobile game? What is an example of, of a good piece of, of UX and a bad piece of UX? I'll not try to name any games, you know, because I'm sure when people play those games, then they come to know about it. So one thing I want to uh, like just uh, touch on, Carl, before, you know, I go into good and bad examples. When when you say user experience, you know, uh, by default, what we are saying is what is it that the user is experiencing, right? No, there is good or bad is not entering the picture, right? It, it is good if user feels after they have... And again, it's not about when they're using it, even after using it, you know, they're compelled to come back to it. They feel, oh, mm -hmm. that made my life easier. And they remember it in a good way. You know, that's, that's example of a good user experience. It's not, of course, the big part is what's happening while they're using the app or the game, but it's also how easy is the recall, how much, how memorable that experience is, mm -hmm. how, how useful it was for them. And the bad is something, you know, when people are cursing <laughs> what they're seeing and they'll say, never again, I'm going to use this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there, there are multiple perspectives to it. You know, um, why I'm saying that is what might be good for the end user or what might could, what can be justified as good user experience by user experience designer might not meet business needs, right? Business might want to just increase monetization and LTV. And for that, you know, they want to emphasize store offers or, you know, hard currency, soft currency things. Uh, so what is most important is you know along with of course good user experience what are the problems we are trying to solve for the user but at the same time how are we making that experience sustainable it's very simple you can have the best uh, possible user experience out there let's say in free to pay you don't have any paywalls so paywalls you know kind of piss a lot of people off players off uh, but they go along with it because they believe uh, the time the value they are getting in exchange of you know going through that paywall or just grinding is worth the experience they are getting so they, they, what i'm trying to say they're always trade offs you know yeah. but we do have to keep in mind user experience is not just all about the user and why i'm saying that is uh, if a game or an app cannot pay for itself you're not creating something sustainable mm -hmm. at some point you're going to say hey guys we can't support it anymore and you, you know, the app or the game is taken away from the user who must have invested a lot of their time, you know. So when we think about UX, we also have to think of the sustainability piece, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, just to give you an example, okay, one of the, one example for me for of a good game, again, not going into specifics is uh, what we call, you know, a lot of games nowadays and even product side is fixated on first time user experience hey and it's important because when you launch the game you're constantly optimizing it mm -hmm. uh, we want day one retention of you know whatever 60 percent for casual game or 30 percent for mid-core game and hardcore it goes to five percent and all that changes but what many developers often forget is even if you fix or fine-tune your you know uh, user experience the first time user experience there's a bigger component of player education. How do you reinforce that knowledge? How do you tell the player again? Here's an example, like I'm using the app and I play it and the tutorial did a good job, but then there are so many games competing with this game. There's a good chance that I might come back to it after a week or two weeks, or, you know, the person had exams or went on vacation. When they come back, now they are not, no longer in their honeymoon period, which is the first time you like, everything is rewarding. You can't, you can make, you can do nothing wrong, you know? <laughs> But then also we should be in a position that anytime they're picking it up in their player journey, be it a new player or older player, they are able to pick up the ropes. They are being constantly told the game should not hide this knowledge. Even if I'm past the first time user experience, uh, I'm somebody who's played the game for six months. Hey, still tell me how can I get better at it? Because from my perspective, I want to master the game balanced with the challenge without cheating. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think there are games who do a good job of what they call, they look beyond first time user experience, say player education. Player education is done on, you know, through tool tips, you know, on demand information, help screens, your uh, loading screens where they put tips in there, you know. So this there's this element of, uh, and even like mission systems, they use the mission system to send player to those hidden parts of the game, which they may not interact with often. That's actually player education for me. So the games which do it well, I think they have a long shelf life. They take this uh, burden away from the player to constantly explore. And you can see this behavior. 
a uh, lot of people are going on you know uh, either um, community channels like twitch or even outside typing hey how do i do this how do i do that uh, and what you are doing is you are forcing users to go outside the game and seek that knowledge now sometimes that's desirable because you want to build community but what i'm saying is the games uh, in my opinion which really do a good job with user experience invest in player education not just first time user experience mm. so that's my advice keep yeah. keep in mind player education not just first time user experience yeah that's that's definitely valuable and and i must say just just hearing you talk about all the different thoughts um and and things that that you 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 have to put thought into just makes me feel overwhelmed really and makes me respect the role of a a ux designer even more because uh, i was reading an article that that you wrote um or that you um you, you co-wrote regarding um the the casualized midcore uh, genre mm -hmm. so the it's um the casual casual gamers that have grown up playing casual games for the last 10 years have kind of grown up and become mid-core gamers now and they're kind of in this in-between phase where they need games that are more challenging than casual games but not as challenging as mid-core and it, it it made me just feel so overwhelmed with how do you possibly manage because the the example that i was that i was reading about that you wrote was uh, about angry birds 2 and how they they took uh, the similar game mechanics from angry birds but made them uh, slightly more complex or added added more systems around the the game loop to make the player have more things to learn and engage with and i just i don't i don't know how you could possibly when you're making a game think of all of these different demographics and people at different times of of their player journey, their age, their um, their location, and and are those all things that you consider? Like, at, at what? How, surely, it's not possible to categorize every single player and timeline, and especially once the the industry is be maturing, it's just going to create more complex situations. So, how do you manage that with with a growing industry? Yeah, so that that's a very good point you touched on, Carl. Um, and that actually makes the job of UX designers and even game designers difficult. So what we can say is, see, every, like every discipline, UX has its uh, basic principles, foundation principles. You know, they are sent user centered design, human centered design, heuristics, um, all that good stuff. Uh, similar to game design, you know, all those Skinner loops and uh, you know, um, I mean, psychological. What, what I can say is, you know, formats which work regarding motivation, regarding, you know, challenge, mastery, all those things, which are intrinsic to human behavior, human nature. Basically, that that's what Ga game designers and UX designers to an extent are doing that. And even product designers, because they're looking at the data. So I think what, what happened when I was writing that article, uh, I saw that in, you know, Angry Birds, and then I saw that in Playrix games. And then I spoke to these guys because I was like, hey, I just don't want to put a hypothesis out there. So what I am doing and... I think what UX designers also do to an extent is they put out, put forward a hypothesis because you don't have all the information. You wouldn't have done all the interviews, you know, qualitative samples, quantitative samples, you wouldn't know. So that was my hypothesis. And when I spoke to them, I was, uh, I discovered, no, they were not thinking about user experience. So if you read those interviews, the game design team, they mm -hmm. were saying, Hey, we had angry birds one. Uh, now we had angry birds two, And we were just looking at how do we scale the game how do we you know increase the lifetime value or engagement retention stats which makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense so i think their motivation was from this side of the coin which said okay uh, how do we get the kpis up and of course in a good way because if the ltv is increasing it means players are enjoying the game more and more people are playing the game and and it's, it's also about catering to your elder players right those who have played angry words or candy crush let's say for six seven years what do you do? You want to leave those players? You want to do something for them? There's no no such thing as the elder game existed in casual games, right? But then for me, I was I looked at the other side and I was like, hey, yes, did it makes sense? You are doing this from product side, but why why you are successful is because that casual player is now accepting it because the moment you throw in a hard mechanics, they would have rejected it, right? So the two forces were were at work. That's what I discovered. But I it was good to see that okay. Part of it came from this, you know, the quantitative data-driven side that we want to scale KPIs. But the acceptance part of it came from, you know, the user behavior side where users are like, hey, we, we have done this, we have mastered this, now we want to move on. So now going back to your question, uh, Carl, yeah, it's not like, 
it's a moving goal post you know i don't think for for example the bartle model exists it is great it is like a foundation piece mm-hmm. but you need to calibrate okay every 2 years 3 years 6 years it's going to mature i'll give you another example so let's say 2007 uh, mobile games or tablets came into existence with apps and games and if you study the data you know use of youtube and the number of parents giving tablets to their kids also skyrocketed from that time because and i've seen this behavior myself uh, uh with colleagues and all that any time they want to you know they want some time for themselves they give a tablet to their kids or oh, it will keep them busy they are either playing games or watching youtube on the tablet so these games these kids were talking about 2007 2008 started you know using mobile and tablets just play when they were one year old literally today 2021 how old are they almost 13 14 years yeah so imagine the amount of dexterity the experience they were mm. literally born with tablets in their hand mm. the kind of games that are appeal to them will be you know they, they, they will they will be able to take more higher load higher friction you know they would definitely be looking at more mid core hardcore they would be comfortable with it even if they don't enjoy it so point is this we have this timeline has to be captured mm. you know i don't know how many i do believe through product function this is indirectly followed by game companies but i think it's time that as ux designers ux function we more consciously start contributing to it hey it's games are becoming games as a service right the uh, longest training games are now almost 8 to 10 years old mm. so this audience curve is maturing and i think every game doesn't matter even if it's the number one game in the world they just have one dream how do we scale the game even more mm. scale the game will only happen when you broaden the funnel you know you're not thinking hey how do i make uh, let's say just uh, 40 50 years old uh, baby boomers play the game or millennials who are 30 years old play the game i'll give you an example i was just looking at uh, call of duty update on my iphone mm. and i saw this promotion picture where it showed you know Hey, you can, there's a picture of uh, Bruce Willis from Die Hard and Rocky from you know a post Rocky, <laughs> and they're saying uh, uh, they're saying like these nostalgic '80s mode available in Call of Duty Mobile. Can you imagine? Can you can you beat it? Why do they have that uh, '80s mode? If you look at Call of Duty, like all the cool skins and gear, they're more like Fortnite. Fortnite, which was just born you know a few yeah. years back. and it's everything modern that is there in shooters but then why are they going back to these 80s yeah. thing sylvester stallone and bruce willis and that makes you think no uh, if you look at shooter genre along with you know these teens who play the game a lot a lot of the audience is 30 years plus yeah. it's people who have grown up with these movies so they're trying to cater to as many segments as possible mm-hmm. same is true of you know candy crush or even play rex games so i think uh, what i'm saying is you cannot you know um foresee all these things in the future but you can definitely uh, build these hypotheses and then you need to test it with different cohorts part of it is validating talk to your player base mm-hmm. uh, but not just the same kind of player base you know there must be a limit so what i would like to do is if i have a game like that i would talk to people the youngest possible audience of my cohort and the oldest possible uh, audience in my cohort mm-hmm. those kind of people who play this kind of game a similar games those kind of people who picked up this game for the first time this genre and that would give me you know a kind of a picture where i can find patterns that's what i would recommend yeah it's 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 interesting uh, just trying to cater to the a, a, a more broader audience like you're saying the 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 these the studios want to want to scale bigger and bigger and it, it, it makes me think of of what companies say like disney what what they try and do with with their movies like they you know which which kind of makes me think like is there a line like is there a line where you have to draw draw a line in the sand that this game is catered to uh to to young kids this like a frozen movie for example where's there's probably elements that they implement to to tailor to adults and you know maybe there's some humor that only adults could really connect with yeah. so they could be entertained by the movie at the same time as their kid but but the merchandise and the the whole a uh, strategy i feel like is geared towards kids still whereas avengers for example is is geared to a different audience and uh do you do you think that that is the the smartest strategy for free to play games to target the wide, widest market um possible rather than having separate experiences that cater like call of duty trying to cater to 
the teens with colorful skins and different patterns and then having an 80s game mode do, do you think that that's not too segmented within the same experience or do you think that that's that's definitely possible i think uh, now you're touching on something <laughs> which again i'll give you an example how ux has evolved so when i joined mobile game industry not joined like more like on the ux side and almost like eight years back starting on game lock let's say <laughs> or even before actually there was there was i had different beliefs so what i am saying is i had to learn I, every year i learn new stuff and i also unlearn stuff which is not working and i, I believe everybody should do that it's a it's a humbling thing to you know um be open to that because that time when i was looking at games i was like hey casual games mid core games remove friction remove friction remove elements you know we should not create a buffet system so by buffet system i mean there is choice bias you have you come into the game you have 12 different buttons mm-hmm. eight different buttons and you are like uh what do i do first as a player i don't know compared to that you know you should just have two three buttons or features hide other ones or you know paste them this one comes after your level 6 8 so that you grasp the complexity as you grow but all that changed when you know uh, live ops became a thing mm-hmm. okay and i'm talking about so my perception changed i was dead against designing uis and ux which gave players a buffet system because i'm like you are confusing them you're creating a choice bias you know it's a lot of friction a lot of cognitive load for them mm-hmm. but then i saw no like uh, there's another way to look at it right if you are scaling the game it is not possible so what what we are also talking about here is how do we personalize the experience for you know different groups of players that's what you're saying like if kids want to play their kind of mode can they exist can it exist i think it comes to personalization and i'm a big believer in personalization but personalization and scaling don't go hand to hand i'll give you an example it's not possible to personalize if you have billions of players for each player per se mm-hmm. right though it happens netflix does that right it curates content for every individual mm-hmm. but at the i think that's at the top of uh, the peak uh, ux experience different elements are there but the peak is it's personalized to that individual mm-hmm. taste and someday gaming will get there mm-hmm. hopefully soon but for now it's not possible because it's a lot of uh, data insights needed a lot of cost for the developers but uh, i think one of the ways to scale is that you create a game where you have these different modes so the player can engage and enjoy that loop you know i think one of the games i would recommend or commend is slotomania it does it very well slotomania has been around for long mm-hmm. and it has something for everything you know people who want to play slots will just play slots people who like narrative story kind of folklore there is that in mm-hmm. there people who want to you know who enjoy slots but also some other elements you know Uh, as in they, they they don't do conventional slots there are other things which happen a lot of bonuses special modes and what not mm-hmm. so what they've done is over time they're saying hey you come into the game and you if you prefer this particular doing this thing more just play that mm-hmm. create multiple progression paths you know like it's it's almost like if you have four battle models a killer achiever a explorer a, a, a campaign player who doesn't wants to socialize if i just do campaign mode in the game i will progress i don't have to bother about the other things mm-hmm. if you don't force the player to you know do what they don't want to do and do more of what they want at the same time probably test with them if they want to try you know something out of their comfort zone i think that can work mm-hmm. and uh, i'll be honest with you just hearing to enough product people i i know that for sure that you know the more you want to make the scale the game more features you want to add and that borrowing will happen you must have seen this term i have used multiple times by genre blending they want to take casual features in you know mid core games mid core games will border from uh, ha- hardcore games so that's going to happen mm-hmm. but again to answer your question i think it can definitely work but it means more you know you have to be very careful again because you don't want to create the choice bias so you have to fine tune the ux you have to fine tune the pacing the personalization done right i think it can work mm. Yeah wow well, that's i mean the more we're talking uh, and and i'm just going to be honest like it is very overwhelming but it is interesting like you're saying you you learn and you unlearn and i think it takes a very certain type of person to be in the ux role because 
I love reading your articles that you talk about the hypotheses of, of what where trends are going. I love reading those articles and I, I eat those up and, and I, I love trying to understand where trends are going. And But if that was my job and if I had to make decisions on a game based on certain data points, it, it must be really difficult to make really big decisions for the future of a game uh, just based off a hypothesis of where you think uh, the the market is going, and and, and I think free to play especially, uh, just because it's it's one growing so fast in so many different areas, uh, it's it's hyper competitive, very saturated. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff happening that I'm sure people are are becoming successful with just very out there um examples uh, like out there experiences that that don't really fit into any category uh I, I i just i remember the the article that you wrote about um narrative and story in in like match three games and and how mm -hmm. that is something that is starting to be um consumed more you know people are, are seeking that that kind of story and narrative element uh in in mobile games and and that's a whole other discussion about storytelling in games and how to tell the best stories and it's it's incredible just how how we're seeing the mobile gaming industry mature uh in a very it's just i don't know it's so fast um like the decisions that you make now are probably so different to what you would have done a year ago based on some of the successes that Absolutely. that have happened um what are what are some just like big picture trends in the industry that you can that you can give now of like maybe just for for someone like i used to go onto the app store and look at like the top 50 or top 10 games uh regularly i haven't done that because i i'm working on in pc now i'm in a very different game climate uh but from your perspective what are some some big trends happening in, in mobile gaming from someone outside of of the the app stores at the moment yeah, sure. So I'll be honest, like past, of course, last one or two months, I haven't, you know, spent that much time. I love to do that kind of research just because of, you know, I took up a new role and I was wrapping up my consulting before yeah. getting into this job. So I was like a lot, lot of work for me to wrap up before I moved in. But uh, yeah, last year, like I, I can just tell you, again, it's there in my articles. I extensively focused on, you know, match three category and one thing I want to bring up is Carl. So it also takes a specific kind of mindset. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> compliment myself here, but what I'm saying is not just me, even if you look at the deconstructor of fun guys, a lot of people read their articles. I learned a lot from them, you know, a great bunch of talented writers. What, what I learned there is like, it's about meta analysis. You would so to make a decision. You need information, mm -hmm. right? Data points, as you said, uh, with, with, the. Um, Data funnels, you are looking at quantitative data with the uh, UX research. You are mostly looking at qualitative. That can also be quantitative. The difference is like we are we are gathering. So the data points, when you look at your you know data funnel uh, hooked into a game, showing what user is doing at different points, this much engagement, this much attention, that's telling you what's happening in the game. So that data, quantitative data tells you what is happening, right? But with UX research, you go in and you talk to those users and you start hypothesizing, you are finding why that is happening. And I think you don't have the complete picture till you know why it is happening. You know, when you combine the what and why you get it, aha, that's, that's what is causing it. Is it happening in enough number of samples? Yeah, that could be a trend. So any point of time that, you know, uh, even I'm doing that, it's a meta analysis. You are, you're phasing it based on, Hey, I see this and I saw this continuously. And it seems it's gaining traction. I, and then I analyze user comments. So I'm looking at these different data points. App Store, like you said, what's trending? What kind of games are trending? What are the users saying about it in community? What has been my experience? You know, what, what were the what would these games be two, four years back? Why are they changing now? Mm -hmm. And why are more mm -hmm. uh, games for? Then I read a lot of industry reports, Facebook reports, or Game Refinery, or you know, Sensor Tower, mm -hmm. Game Analytics, all my sponsors. <laughs> so <laughs> thing is. Then you are seeing these dots. It's not that you are guessing it, but then some, then if you have that kind of a mindset, again, I, I would say it takes a specific kind of mindset. Probably it comes with, from people who have either, you know, have a background in statistics mm -hmm. or data or do data analysis. They see these dots and they start connecting. So mm -hmm. I literally do that, you know, because that's the only way I can tell you now what is going to happen 
uh, in six months or 12 months. Otherwise, anybody can say, or I can say, hey, it just happened. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, this is what <laughs> happened because of this. So and I'm not always right. Neither is everybody else out there. But that's also the whole point of writing it. Because when I put it out there, my objective is, hey, people, sm- there's smarter people than me out there. Read it. Do you agree? Disagree? You know, and then I'll they, they tell me. Many times they tell me, hey, well, you wrote this, but you know, this is not exactly how it happens. Mm-hmm. This is the reason. So then I correct it the next time uh, and so on. So yeah, just coming back to your question, one of the trends, I was focusing a lot on Match 3 because there was all these data wars going on, all Match 3 companies, you know. I mean, 2020 was the year of Match 3, right? Mm-hmm. Like it made the most money, I think 5.10 mm-hmm. billion or something. And I think I was, what I was saying was that there are these different elements that were, you know, coming out like, hey, everybody's moving to meta because Playrix proved its value. And then four or five more games like, you know, Lily's Garden, and Matchington Mansion came along and they had some good amount of success. Mm-hmm. And then we saw King also pivoting towards meta goals, uh, learning from Playrix. And then you saw some of these IPs from Blue Mobile coming in, like Property Brothers, they're getting an IP decoration. Mm-hmm. So my, my mm-hmm. hypothesis there was, hey, this is fine. People are making money, but nobody's, there's no challenger for, you know, games from King and Playrix. So imagine if somebody wants to build a game who could compete with them. So then when I tell you, like, you will see the natural progression. What do they have to do? Mm-hmm. All the classic mastery players are locked with King, right? Because they're, they're loyalists. They've been playing that game for long, an uh, old audience. Mm-hmm. Playrix has the decoration, you know, monopoly uh, plus UA muscle. All the other games that are coming in, they're just cloning that decoration thing. Okay, mm-hmm. home decoration, home de- and story. And I said, okay, the key to your success becoming top grossing, top 10 grossing is scale. That's what I said. Mm-hmm. And then I said, to get scale, you have to move out of classic match three and decoration. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, it's logical, right? If I was a PM, I wanted to develop a game. Mm-hmm. I would say, okay, story is trending. People are, uh, and I, I, I base it on reports as well, as you see, it's not like just my own hypothesis. I'm saying, hey, Game Refinery found that in last two years, 50% games, chance of your game being successful or the new games that came to top 200, they all had meta and 50% of them had story elements, even though the number of games launched were even more, you know, because mastery is very lucrative. But just by extrapolating that information, they all had meta check. Mm-hmm. They are more likely with story element. Okay. And then like I told you, you know, for me, that's a data point. What is happening? And then I start digging. Okay, mm-hmm. why? Why are they looking at meta? Why? Why is story getting popular? Mm-hmm. And then you know, I I speak to experts in that field, like Lisa Brunet, you know. And then uh, I see my own hypothesis that okay, people like you know stories because everybody is on so- social media. What are they consuming? Stories. Mm-hmm. Every post they read is a story. You know. Then you saw this Facebook report. So when you get so what you are doing is you have a you have a hypothesis, but then you need to find those pieces which validate it mm-hmm. or disprove it. Not always. You don't want to cherry pick the data. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think for 2022, I would predict something when I get more time. But 2021, I think for me was a good year because I was saying right from the beginning that there will be a new contender. It will have these elements and then Project Makeover came out. So it kind of, you know, validated. So yeah, but yeah, sorry if I, I don't know if it answers the question, what are the big trends, but I would still yeah. stick to those articles for now. I'm, I'm sure that that's a question that you get asked a lot and that you 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 need like, yeah, that, that question wasn't fishing for the next big article or next big thing, uh, because I know it's a, it's a constant pro, progress, process and it probably takes you a lot of time to put together those hypotheses and to find the data. And, it's, and that's what I respect is that you have the, amount you you have the the um what's the word like commitment to to go out and do the research and i think a a lot of people might leap to uh conclusions when they see just a few data points or like you're saying cherry pick the things that make sense to them but i feel like you really have a sense of 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 you you love the 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 craft of of doing the research you know it's it's not that you're trying to uh guess the next best thing it's like you you really care about where trends are going and 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 how these data points relate to each other uh so i love that uh one term that i i read in one of your posts that i'd love you to elaborate on is what is cognitive load management um Mm. how can you help me understand that yeah so cognitive 
in very simple terms would mean you know anything to do with mental work so when we work physically we are using our muscles right uh, physical muscles arm muscles leg muscles so same way the kind of uh, uh, work that the mind does in a very broader sense of course i can go deeper is called cognitive you know mm-hmm. uh, these are cognitive actions mental cognitive actions and cognitive load is exactly that like if i work out and i can pick up 5 kg weight and then suddenly you're giving me 10 kg weight to lift my muscles will be taxed right because my mind is also trained to you know uh do things uh, to what they, what what it has been exposed to like it has habits it has patterns one thing is like mind has patterns right our mind is the laziest uh, machine in the world in a sense because and that's how we have survived so what the mind does is if you give it a problem it tries to find the simplest possible solution right it doesn't wants to go like a computer do thousands of calculations and that's human mind that's evolution we are our mind everybody's mind is trained to find hey what is the simplest possible way to do this and once they keep doing more of that they find okay yeah this is will this will stick to me you have created a pattern inside your brain you know which is called also plasticity neuroplasticity but anyways coming back to cognitive load it just means the more stress yeah the more stress you are putting on you know a person's mind to figure out a task it could be using a app playing a game to understand stuff that's cognitive load that's adding to the cognitive load you know mm-hmm. we also another term would also be i like to interchangeably use is friction friction for the mind so that that simply said this that is what it is okay yeah no that makes that makes a lot of sense i love i love this conversation and uh, i could probably talk to you for hours about you know the psychology behind games and and player choices and uh, because i'm not uh, uh you know I, i i'm not educated in that area but it's definitely a, a strong interest of mine uh, so it just everything you're saying just kind of puts more questions in in, in my mind um i i'd love to kind of go a bit more broader as to what your perspective is on the future of of games in general maybe maybe keep it to to just mobile uh because i feel like that's the area that that you probably understand the best but how do you see in like 5 10 years this and because it's it's growing every year mobile gaming is is continuing to to grow and it's dominating the games industry as a whole i think it's over 60% maybe over 65% of of the 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 global games industry which is huge really uh, really <laughs> how much say 70 70 yeah. or 71 which is yeah, yeah. incredible and it's it seems to be continuing to grow and uh and I'd love to know where you see do you see any big shifts happening in the next 5 years whether it comes whether it's uh platforms or uh different ch- like changes in play behavior as the industry matures is there anything interesting that you can share there yeah i think if you're looking at 5 to 10 years of course call uh I mean this is like well known every 5 years technology shifts you know it, it makes a big leap mm-hmm. and you can see that right from uh coming off internet way back in 90s to 2000 then internet boom of 2000 then the you know websites were the big thing then came mobile mm-hmm. so every 5 years technology takes a major shift we, we do, one thing is a lot would depend on what is that major shift is is that you know we are we are able to control devices you know through our thought waves or is it like immersion becomes easier i think the biggest challenge with ar vr is you need extra devices you need screens you know what if that was not a binding factor but that apart whatever that shift would be uh, keeping that aside i think cross platform is something which is on the cards you know so people would love to pick it up on you know one Uh, device and take it on the next it's happening already fortnite is cross platform many of the big games are cross platform so i think that should happen because it's about omni channel experience right like users should be like hey if i can leave it here and pick it up there that's that's like the easiest thing to do nothing more friction so seamlessness will be more there technology will make things more seamless and um, for me i think i would also focus on the in 15 20 years the kids <laughs> born in 2008 would definitely be you know where probably we are today millennials 30 years old or 35 years old mm. and it would be interesting because they they are already very dexterous they've already probably consumed some of the 
what we as adults call you know uh, hardcore or midcore experiences right when it comes to gaming mm-hmm. so for them i think the the chasm or the hunger will be even more what mm-hmm. more can you do how much more can you evolve the mechanics because they've already they're already consuming what we are giving them right now mm-hmm. and i think like what roblox is doing and we also seen like a lot of noise on cryptocurrency side which i try hard not to get into <laughs> from a data perspective but it's interesting because see at there's a prosumer model right now right and you see roblox it is successful because user generated i think user generated will also skyrocket uh, roblox has already proved and again i wrote about it four years back that ugc will also start dominating uh it it's it's today the top grossing app on the you know in the games category it's just because you know and think about this generation too it's making it's not that you need a specialized engineering degree now to you know go into this virtual realm and start making money mm-hmm. crypto is also something doing doing something similar in parallel you know the nfts and all these things coming out i don't know how much of that is a fad how much will fade away but you can definitely say carl i think in next 15 years you know e- even uh, epic ceos you know uh what he said repeatedly about you know the metaverse mm-hmm. i think metaverse is a digital marketplace you know or a digital world where you can not just you just don't go in there to you know get entertainment mm-hmm. but you can also generate stuff create stuff learn your social networks are merging your games are merging you're making meeting people through that you know uh, and why i'm saying that i know it it sounds a bit science fiction but think about it that's 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 what happens every 15 years touch mm-hmm. technology was magic in 2000 in sci-fi movies you would see you know i don't know which one was that from uh, tom cruise there was the sci-fi movie i think in 90s or 2000 that where he was just you know working on a touch interface and people like that's so cool that's future yeah. thing that that happens in the future only it's happening right Every, everybody has that yeah. so i think the f- 15 years changes would be more bold more aspirational more something which we are not willing to believe that can happen today but yeah, this is what i see yeah. yeah i'm 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 glad you mentioned the metaverse without me having to bring it up and uh, that makes me really happy because i've spoken uh, about the metaverse to a lot of people on the show and um uh i try not to go there because it can get very fluffy very big picture but um i love that you t- that you touched on it and um that definitely makes makes a lot of sense um i had a Uh, an interesting question uh, but it's it's gone away from me now um but uh the like you mentioned Roblox and creating in in these environments uh and that's that's an an area that I kind of want to uh, gear towards the end of the the podcast and talk to you about and that's how wide games can get um in terms of games being used for education you mentioned that your partner works in UX in a different industry uh and And, and I'd love to know your perspective on how wide you think games can get in terms of gamification of software and education and other industries. And that's a topic I love to, to talk about on the podcast as well. Do you foresee the definition of a game becoming more gray as we become more entrenched in technology and more uh used to these these cycles of uh game loops within tasks that we spend our our daily lives going through do you think about that a lot is that an area that you think the future will go further into yeah so i think that that's very interesting and i think that can happen carl there's a good possibility you know um we we might not even call them games <laughs> anymore because yeah. think about it every so from outside games everybody is very intrigued by gaming industry obviously because they see the boom they see the people and of course they themselves play those games um and every i know that every e-commerce company is using gamification processes you know i have seen reward companies which do these reward points and you get rewarded badges which you can redeem for real gifts you know and people are using those gaming techniques there's the reward system bad system meditation apps are using it i think the line will blur i think the biggest shift will be once people realize again this is something i'll go back to economics again <laughs> i think it goes back to 
uh, two things, the digital economy, you know, we are, we live in a world where still we talk about, you know, um, commodities and goods which exist in the real world, you know, things you eat, things you manufacture, but digital goods have real values, right? And I'm not talking about NFT, non-fungible tokens and on, but even inside the game, what are we selling? We are selling digital goods, right? Mm-hmm. They're not white goods or stuff that uh, you can consume physically, but this still create value for the user. People still, you know, find joy out of it. it they, they, they like that experience. So I think if this digital goods economy keeps growing, Mm-hmm. There is nothing to say it cannot rival what we see in the actual world, the mm-hmm. physical good economy. And that's the key. Once there is every economy, every time something new happens, it's called a gold rush, right? So again, now when I'm speaking about it, I think you can see crypto is also kind of that explosion of digital good economy. And it, it's very volatile right now, as it is with any new gold rush. But, you know, I think the key is not the games. The key is games will only grow. The metaverse will only grow once the digital economy takes off. People are actually see, making serious money. They don't, the barrier to entry is low. This is what Roblox is doing. You don't need an engineering education to build a game. They're making it easier for people, kids to start you know, building stuff. And I think games are somehow going to make the barrier to entry to this digital world, whatever we call it, metaverse, more seamless, more easy, almost like a second nature, you know, and then there are these interesting possibilities. Maybe some people would want to work in there. Maybe that's how we are getting our tasks. You know, it's a game within a game or I don't know, like, like a real within a real. Think about it right now. Everybody's working remotely. Who's to say, you know, yeah. I mean, it's all digital. I'm seeing you digitally. You are seeing me digitally, right? Uh, exactly. And yeah. So I think the key is the digital economy Yeah. that will lead to this adoption by adoption i love that that's a, an angle that i haven't i haven't heard before and that uh that did kind of give me a a, a mind-blown moment just trying to compare the physical economy with a digital economy and 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 when that shift is going to happen and, and when it does how that might change the world as we know it uh that's a really really powerful thought and really interesting and and something i'd I'd, i think is perfect to end in this podcast on uh so thank you for going there Uh, i'm glad we went there because i think you have uh with your knowledge of economics and um and your studies and your your passions i think that that's a perfect area to to talk about i wish i could talk to you more about it but maybe in a year's time we could talk about uh, your trends, uh, your 2022 trends, or, and see if, if what you predicted this year ends up happening and, and all that good stuff. I think uh, I'd love to keep the conversation with you going. Uh, but uh, thank you, Om, for giving your time and your knowledge uh, on the show. If anyone that's listening is interested in following Om, you can connect with them on LinkedIn at Om Tandom. Um, uh, you, uh, you have a Twitter as well, I believe, but I don't think you're very active on it. Is there anywhere uh, else that, that people um, can get in touch with you if, if they want? I think LinkedIn is the best place and then they can follow my blog, UX Reviewer. I just want to like clarify, I don't consult anymore because of course I have a full-time job now, but yeah. I do publish articles from time to time there. And for anybody looking for you know some knowledge, they can... Yeah, definitely feel free to ping me on LinkedIn or why yeah. are you extra Awesome. Well, I hope I hope to see some some more of your articles out there. Uh, I do really enjoy it and going down that rabbit hole of of thought and theories and uh, trying to trying to see what what's happening. But uh, otherwise, I do wish you the best with your new role at Wildlife, and I'm excited to see the the projects that you guys uh, release over there. So uh, yeah, thanks for your time, Om, and uh, wish you the best uh, rest of your day. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Bye.